All right, hey everybody, welcome back. Tonight we're gonna to talk about wine labels, wine blending, and um, laws associated with how we label our wines and what we can do. So what is wine blending? This is really known as the art, where art comes in and the expression and you know uh, attention to detail and winemaking. So this includes mixing together two or more different wines, um, differing in either variety or the vintage. So for example, a 2016 GSM would be, the vintage is 2016, so all those grapes are harvested in 2016, and it also contains three different varieties, Grenache, Syrah, and Movedra, hence GSM. Um, there's also, sometimes you see NV, which means a non-vintage. So like a non-vintage Cab Franc would be mostly Cab Franc variety, but consists of wines from different vintages. So it could be a blend of 2019, 2020, you know, 2015, Cab Franc all blended together. So that'd be non-vintage Cab Franc. So that's kind of just a start. Then if we want to dive more into it, we have how to read a wine label. So first thing, and it just depends upon region, like France, they don't always put the producer's name so big on the label because they're more terroir focused. They might just have like the region. Um, Italy does that sometimes too in other regions. But in general, you know, we ha have our brand name. It's typically the largest thing on the bottle. It's our brand name. So that's the person who produced the wine. Then we have a special des designation. So reserve is a special designation. It could mean that it aged longer, um, that it spent you know, more time in oak, that it was hand selected out of the lot to age longer and all this fun stuff. But we're going to learn more about that specifically in a couple slides. Then we have uh, wine type, grape variety, Cabernet Sauvignon. So that is the variety of grapes that made this wine, Cabernet Sauvignon. We have vineyard designation, which is Jack's Estate Vineyard. Then we also have alcohol content down here, 14.1%. So alcohol must always be displayed on a label. It's one of the laws of TTB. Other details we have are like the vintage 2012, this is the year that the grapes were harvested. It's not the year that the wine was sold. So 2012 is the vintage of the harvest. A state bottled means that 100% of the grapes were grown, crushed, fermented, and finished, and bottled on the same exact property. So if that means a lot to you, that's a nice designation to pay attention to. Then we have something I like, which is called the fanciful name, which is a marketing term used to differentiate the brand or maybe differentiate, you know, the, the type of cab. So like they could potentially have, you know, three different cabs and one could be like the heritage blend and one could be the ghost story and something else. But a fanciful name is mostly made for marketing and to help you remember that specific label. Then we also have like appellations of origin. This is really important where the grapes come from specifically, not just the wine, but where the grapes came from to produce that one. We're going to talk about all these percentages here in a couple slides or the next slide. So for labeling requirements, this is for the United States. It depends. It changes when you go from country to country, but these are the laws for us here. So for a winery to claim a vintage, it's got to be 95%. So if I say this is Claire's blunt, this is Claire's, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon to 2018, 90 95% of that wine had to be been that vintage to claim it on the label. So there's only a 5% buffer room there. For a vineyard designation, it also needs to be 95%. So if I claim this came from the Walker Vineyard in Pleasant Valley, 95% of those grapes had to have come from the Walker Vineyard. Okay. For a variety, 75% of that wine must be that claimed variety. So this is a, let's say this is a 2019 Zinfandel from Walker Vineyard. 95% of that had to be 2019. 95% had to have come from Walker Vineyard. 75% of that had to be Zinfandel. So if I also had Petite Syrah from Walker Vineyard from that same vintage, I could still call it Zinfandel. So up to 25%. So it gets a little tricky. There's some loopholes. I would definitely pay attention to those percentages. If I wanted to claim an American viticultural area or an AVA, so like El Dorado, uh, Sierra Foothills, Stag's Leap, 
And some of these AVAs are very large and broad, and some of them are very small and specific. So El Dorado, small and specific. Fair Play, even smaller and more specific. But those are all, both of those AVAs are part of the greater Sierra Foothills AVA. So you just have to know your regions and know your maps. But if you're going to claim that on your bottle, 85% has to come from the region that you claim. And this could be a real marketing tactic too because for some people who like live local and know our regions, having a wine that's labeled Fair Play could be highly desirable because it's a high elevation, small AVA within El Dorado within our home. Someone shopping for wine from Nevada or even the East Coast might not know where the hell Fair Play is. So they might not know where that is. They might not be drawn to it like we would. Or maybe they do, you know, you just never know. So in that case, a producer that distributes a lot might just want to say Sierra Foothills because that might be a more recognizable region on a bottle than just fair play. So some important marketing decisions to be made there, but you could do either or as long as you had the 85% requirement. Okay, if you're going to claim California wine, it's got to be 100%. And these are typically wines that are just mass marketed that are purchased grapes from all over the state. It's a fun, huge blend, but it all has to come from California, 100%. You can't be blending grapes from Nevada, from Idaho, anywhere else. It's got to be 100% California. Also, estate. If it's going to be an estate wine, 100% of the wine must come from the grapes grown on the estate property. It has to be processed from the estate, bottled on the estate. So, very important things to know. But that's... That's why tasting wines can get so tricky because of this right here, 75% of the variety, because we can taste through 10 Zinfandels and up to 25% of that wine could be anything else. And you could blend it with Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot, Grenache. Those are all going to be wines that taste extremely different from each other. So when it comes down to understanding what that variety is at 100% Zinfandel, it's really easy for consumers to get confused or not understand the variety because it's been blended with something um, that changes it quite drastically. So that 25% does go a long way. Okay, on to special designations. So, and again, this applies only to the United States. This doesn't apply to other countries. So special designations like Old Vine Zen, Reserve, Seller Select and Vintners Blend have absolutely no legal obligations or meaning in the United States. There is simply marketing tactics to impress consumers. The definition of what that means per winery varies. So if you go wine tasting and, you know, someone's charging, let's say, $80 for their reserve cab, but they only charge $20 for their regular cab, just ask the tasting room staff member and they should hopefully be educated in what made that price difference. I'm not saying that everyone's trying to cheat you. I'm just saying that the definition varies from winery to winery. So for some, they might be, oh, well, it's 100% new oak. We aged it for four years instead of two, and we did X, Y, and Z to make it a higher quality product. We hand-selected these barrels out of the lot. We tasted through each barrel, and these were the most exceptional ones. You know, there could be a lot of reasons, but there is nothing legally binding to a winery to make them uh, go by a special definition for reserve wines. Same thing for old vines in. There's no age requirement. Um, You don't have to prove to the government that your vines are a certain age to claim old vines in, um, which is kind of upsetting. But, um, you know, just knowledge for you, knowledge for the consumer. That being said, there are a lot of old vines in across California and even Australia. But, um, you know, just check in. Just make sure that it's legit, or if you don't care, you know, continue on. Also, this is where things get really tricky too. Natural wine, what is a natural wine? Please enlighten me. Has no legal meaning or value other than no additional alcohol was added to it. So no spirits or brandy. So everything that's fermented came from sugar that it was harvested at, fermented into alcohol. That is a natural wine. Everything is natural. However, if a wine is labeled as organic and or made with organic grapes, that definitely carries legal meaning. Um, Here's again just another definition on natural wine. So this is the actual 
uh, definition by the Trade and Tax Bureau, the TTB. Also have a little link there if you want to see. However, for organic wine, like we were saying, the definition of organic really varies around the world. Again, so it just depends on what the government decided, um, what the organic uh, group had settled on. So for the United States, for a wine to be classified as, as organic, so for the wine, first has to be made with organic grapes. So it has to come from a vineyard that's organic, certified organic, and this means no fertilizers, pesticides, uh, fungicides, and sulfur. And sulfur prevents mold, so this becomes very challenging for vineyards to uphold this. So you have to start with organic grapes if you want to have organic wine. Then, once you take those organic grapes, you have to treat it an organic style as well. So that means no added sulfur to the wine. Um, the European Union allows some sulfites. We allow basically none. So don't be confused. If this is something that's very important to you, it's very important to know the difference between wine made from organic grapes versus organic wine. There is a difference. So if it's just made from organic grapes, the vineyard was certified organic, but then they use sulfites during the winemaking production. If it's organic wine, it's both. Organic grapes, organic practices in the cellar. So something that's very important. So for the U.S., we have no added sulfites for organic wine. For the European Union, they have, um, for dry reds, 100 parts per million. I'm assuming that's total sulfur. For dry whites, 150. And for others, you know, 30 parts per million and below for conventional. So, the more you know. Okay, next question would be, since we're talking about blending and percentages, when would I utilize blending in a winery? There's a lot of good times to utilize blending. Uh, if you are a experienced winemaker and you know what you're doing versus if you want to save everything for the end and make sure it's really precise, you know what's going on. Um, it just depends, but it can be utilized at many, many different times of the winemaking stage, uh, winemaking process. So here's a fun uh, little quote. If you want to enhance the current wine you're working with, uh, just remember that perfect is the enemy of good. Voltaire said that. So there comes a point where you blend and you blend so hard that you get diminishing returns, right? At, you can make some adjustments that make the wine immediately better, but at some point, you kind of get lost in the thick of it, and your returns are just less and less, depending on how much work you are. But it just depends on your philosophy. Ultimately, we want to utilize blending to cover any flaws that you might think the wine has. So this could be the color is too light, that's lacking flavor, there's no aromatics, there's no body, there's no tannin, there's you know very low alcohol or too high alcohol. It needs some sweetness. It needs some acidity. So these are all components that make a wine a good wine. Depending on the variety, they're in different amounts. You have to know that variety to truly express what it should be. Um, so blending wines together often results in a more cohesive end product than just simply adding, you know, acid, concentrate, like I showed you guys in class, that big tub of, like, sugary uh, syrup. That, is, that does come from grapes, but, you know, and or other components that are already naturally in the wine. So, like we said, wine is a very complex matrix. It just blends better if you do wine with wine rather than just trying to add a bunch of products to it. So, or at least that's a lot of my philosophy. So, tips for blending that are really important. Know the wines individually first. So, you have to understand what you're trying to make in the end goal. If you want to make the best Grenache the world has ever seen, you need to understand that Grenache is typically a lighter red. It's not a Petit Syrah. Those are completely different wines. So having an understanding of the different varieties you're working with and what you're trying to do will really help you understand where you're going. So there's a purpose to what you're trying to do. You understand what you're doing and how you're going to get there. Also, it really helps if you start by blending the highest percentage first. So say we're making a Grenache and say it's lacking color even for what a Grenache should be. Well, we know we can add, if we we're trying to make a Grenache that's a wine bottle that's labeled as Grenache, we know we can add up to 25% any other variety as long as it's the same vintage 
and the other requirements we're trying to meet. So say we blend some Syrah in there. Well, let's do 25% because that's the max that we can do. We'll taste that and then we'll see exactly what it did to the Grenache. That way we know, do we like this? Do we just want to scale it back? Was 25% perfect? Does it taste more like a Syrah than a Grenache at this point? You know, do we need to take it back? Those kind of questions come into play. But with the 25%, you can really understand um, where it's heading once you do that. It's very, very important to take notes. Write down the percentages. Write down your thoughts. Um, tasting the wines and blendings becomes very fatiguing. You get tired. You forget what happened. You get caught up in a conversation with someone. and Something tastes amazing, but you forgot what it was. Write it down. Give yourself some time. Decision fatigue is very real. So definitely know your limits. Uh, take a step away. Have some coffee. Come back later. Always be a safe taster. You know, always be safe when it comes to the stuff. It's nice to break it down over the course of a couple of days just to really know what you like. Interestingly enough, the best time to evaluate wine is first thing in the morning. And this is probably the only time anyone's going to tell you to do this. Don't brush your teeth and don't eat anything sugary in the morning. Want to make sure you have some food in your stomach? Don't brush your teeth because all of the toothpaste and everything is going to ruin your palate and you're not going to be able to actually taste wine. So yes, this is what experts recommend. Also, I'm going to add on here, um, don't wear perfume or cologne or any of that stuff. Uh, it's going to inhibit your ability to smell the wine. I totally spelled this wrong. Thank you. Um, to smell the wine and um, taste and understand what's really going on. It's also going to frustrate the people around you because they're only going to be able to smell your perfume and not the wine. So please don't do that. The ultimate goal in blending and creating a good wine in general is all about balance, right? So depending on the variety, once you know the variety, you want to understand, does it have color, aroma, flavor, and body? And you also have to think about the completeness of the wine. My mom's an English teacher, so I always use the analogy of a good wine is a good essay, which I hated writing essays, so it's funny I have to talk about them. But there's an attention grabber, there's a good intro, there's good body, and then there's a good conclusion, a good finish. So those are the components that make a good wine, too. It can have no attention grabber, so like no aromatics, no complexity, or the color is just not very um, appetizing then that's not going to be a good wine, right? Even if everything else was fantastic, it's still lacking in a major part. So like I said, good attention grabber, entry, you know, introduction, body, and conclusion. So it's going to take you on a journey. You're going to want to come back and taste more. You're going to keep discovering more complexity. It's going to be inviting. That's what really makes a good wine. And also being true to variety, if that's what you're claiming on your label. It's really what it comes down to. For some people, wine blending is all about tradition. And it makes sense because, you know, these wines grew together, so they'd naturally blend well together from similar regions and climates. So some would say, you know, blending Cabernet Sauvignon with Pinot Noir would be total blasphemy. It's just like ridiculous. It's two completely different regions of France. You have, you know, Bordeaux and, you know, Rhone or whatever, or I'm sorry, Burgundy. And it's just, like, insane. So sticking to grapes that originated in that region is just what a lot of winemakers just swear by. And they like to keep it traditional and like to do that. So that means keeping Bordeaux together, Rhones together, and Italian varieties together, and so forth. And that's actually one of the big complaints with the Super Tuscan scandal. And it was a scandal, trust me when Italian winemakers were blending Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot with their wines. It was total, like, chaos. It's more widely accepted now, but um, it was considered just, like, ludicrous. Like, why would you choose a French variety over all of the literally hundreds of Italian varieties we have here at our disposal? So, just depends. So, if you're trying to stick with tradition, Bordeaux varieties would be, you know, and this would be true of a Bordeaux blend, Cab Sauv, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot, Merlot, and Malbec. Petit Syrah. It's actually not a Bordeaux. Pardon me. So it's the two cabs, the two M's, and Petit Verdot. That's how you remember. So for Rhone, we have, you know, GSM, 
Syrah, Mavedra, Pinot Noir, Grenache. And for Italian varieties, we have Barbera, Primitivo, Sangiovese, Zinfandel, Nebbiolo, uh, Montepulciano. Those would all be in the Italian family. So that would be what you're looking at. So then following up on, you know, when and where can blending happening in the winemaking process? Like I said, if you are really um, have a lot of experience and feel really confident what goes together, you can do what's called a co-fermentation, which you actually pick uh, grapes and then ferment them at the same time together. You can also, what's found in a lot of, not in a lot of wineries, but sometimes wineries do this, um, sometimes they'll actually plant vines of a different variety within a block so that way it enhances color so think of this like say you have a block of pinot noir pinot noir is a very light red um sometimes people might plant a couple vines of let's say um petite Syrah, and just do and it would be scattered across the vineyard and you would never know unless you studied ampelography and did a very close look through the vineyard um to enhance the flavor or and en- also enhance the color too because petite Syrah is a really dark bold colored variety so this is also seen with in real life with sometimes vineyard owners will plant tinturier varieties so those are a specific grape variety where the juice itself is a very very dark color already most all juices of wine are lack color until skin contact from the grape so they plant tinturiers randomly in blocks in the vineyard and they'd harvest it and no one would know any better. So just end up having a higher color variety. If you were to do this though, another a way to kind of identify tinturiers is if a single vine, the leaves turn red in the fall, like bright, bright red um, within the block. So the rest of the block will be green and then you'll see a couple uh, spots of red throughout the cross, throughout the uh, block. That's a, that's a sign that there are tinturiers planted secretly within the block of that vineyard, which is really interesting. Um, it could be red blotch disease if you see it in pretty vast uh, patches. But if you see like a single vine that's completely red like that, that's most definitely a different variety like a tinturier. So anyways, other times that you would see blending happening would be during topping. So as you see this gentleman here, he is filling up the barrel with a pitcher of wine so topping is what happens through over time through barrel aging. Wine evaporates through the pores of the barrels. Very natural process. It's just osmosis. So the wine's evaporating through the pores of the barrels very slowly. This is called the angel's share. As that happens, the volume of wine lowers over time. And this is actually somewhat desired. This concentrates the flavors of the wine and helps micro oxygenate it, all this stuff. You don't want too much headspace in the barrel to develop for too long. So this is when the topping process happens. We actually fill that space with more wine to refill the barrel completely. And then um, we'll do that. This is a great time to introduce blending. So like one of the things that Boger is well known for is adding Cabernet Sauvignon to a lot of our wines. We do this during the topping process because Cab just has a lot of beautiful structure and fruit. It just works out for the wines that we have. So that's a great time to introduce a little bit of blending. Also, some of the major blending happens right before bottling. That's when we'll really taste through the wines and make decisions on specific percents. Like if we want to add 10% or 15% of something else, we'll put that into a tank and blend it specifically. Taste again after it's been blended, see if we want to add anything else. And then we'll go through the steps of bottling it and getting it ready for sale. So that would be the times that we would blend mostly okay then we have the rigor of the selection process so it's very interesting to note that even if you bought a hundred of the same barrel say i just had a ton of money i just bought a hundred medium plus american oak barrels and over time i'm aging wines in them and using them well as they become exposed to different environments different positions of the cellar, different yeast, um, all these fun things. Every barrel becomes its own micro environment and they actually start to taste a little bit different than the others. So um, even to the extent of say you have an intern who forgot to sulfur or top a barrel, it could become oxidized and bad. We don't want to pump that and combine it in a tank with all of the good barrels, so we'll say so to speak. 
So there's a huge process where a lot of winemakers will go through and taste each barrel individually. I know, such a hard life. Um, but it does become very exhausting to and mark the ones that are the best or mark the ones that are, you know, if there are anything that's oxidized or has spoiled before we pump it into a tank and blend it with others. So that could be part of the blending process too. Um, and it can be very difficult. So during the blending process, when we start to, you know, think about like right before blending, this process typically involves multiple people where we sit down and discuss percentages and taste together, discuss together, see what the wine is missing. Um, and this is very important because you want to get a good grasp for what a multiple person audience is going to think of that blend. One person might pick out something that you don't, or one person might miss out, um, you know, be very sensitive to bitterness. One person's very sensitive to, to VA or uh, vinegar flavors and aromas and wine. So it, it really benefits you to get multiple people's um, point of view on the wine before you make the big decision to bottle it. Another interesting thing is that while winemaking can be considered, you know, very romantic and, you know, very fun, cool job, the reality of the situation is that a lot of these businesses have to approach it in a business way. It's not all the time that winemakers get to make something that they want to do or want to enjoy. We, As a business perspective, we always have to think about what the consumer wants and what the consumer enjoys. So that's the reality of the situation. The winemaker is not going to purchase all of the wine that they make. Um, it's up to us to sell it to the consumers, know what they want, know their expectations, and try to execute that the best that we can. There are exceptions for that. Um, sometimes they might have like a winemaker select, you know, and they might do a very small case amount and it might be very expensive. Um, but ultimately, I'd say every winery has to make some compromises and make, you know, at least half of their inventory has to be made with the consumer in mind. So that's hard. You hear it from a lot of musicians too, actually. So that's just the reality of how a business works. So here is a chart on Wine Folly's interpretation on blends. And even though she's a psalm, she's not a winemaker, uh, I really do like this visually because I think she has something going on here. So what we have here is an example of a GSM blend. What we have is kind of this exaggerated peak to kind of tell you where the flavors sit on your palate, depending if it's the entry or the approach, the mid palate or the finish. So for Grenache, the Grenache that she tasted or her interpretation is the Grenache has a really nice mid palate, but not so much on the entry and not so much on the finish. For her, Syrah had a great entry, but not a fantastic finish. And Mavedra is kind of sloping towards mid and finish. But when we blend all those varieties together and create a GSM, we find a wine that basically hits all of the sections really nicely. It has a good approach. It carries it into the mid palate and then it finishes nicely at the end. So this is, I feel like, is a really good representation of what we're trying to accomplish with blending. Um, same thing with Bordeaux. We have Cab Sauve, Merlot, Cab Franc, Malbec, and Petit Verdot. Um, you see just all these layers of structure and intensity and, you know, just kind of how it overlays in the part that each wine plays. So definitely when you do blending, you do like the 25% rule where you add the max and stuff. Try to imagine a wine like that. Try to think of don't worry about thinking of like specific flavors and aromas unless they just immediately come to you, but think about does it have an entry, a mid, and a finish? And does it need help? Does it need blending? Not all wines need blending. Sometimes they're just good by themselves. And some winemakers' philosophies are against blending. Some winemakers' philosophies are this represents the vintage, this wine represents the challenges of that year, it's lacking color because we had frost damage or something, um, and this is the reality of what happened this year and it tells the story and I'm not trying to hide that. So you'll find that sometimes and that's highly respectable. It just depends on the winemaker and the business again. Okay, so a final word. There's not really a wrong or right way to blend. It's very personal. It's very much an art of expression. Um, interestingly enough, you can blend white wines with reds, reds with whites, 
the possibilities are endless. So that's the most intriguing thing about winemaking. The question is, if you are having a business and you have bills to pay, is will it sell? <laughs> but that's a story for another time. Anyways, we do have some recommended reading for you guys. Just a couple of links about, um, you know, blending requirements. This last one is a slide from the TTB, the Trade and Tax Bureau, through the government about label requirements specifically if you want to get into all the legal stuff. Then we have Wine Folly and Wine Magazine's approach on wine blending as well. Okie dokie. All right, that was wine blending. Hope you guys learned some stuff. We'll do some blending in class. All of our wines are the same vintage, um, but we will have a chance to really see how blending can help a wine. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you next time.